Okay, today is September 25th, 2011, and I'm going to redo what I tried to do last night. Um, if you want to read a more, if you want to watch a more condensed version of the version I'm doing today, very condensed version, you're welcome to. It's still going to be up at YouTube, but I'm going to do this uh, in a more non rush style because there's a lot of facts involved and I don't want to leave any doubt as to um, how I came to my conclusions. And again, I'll just start over again with the story. So I'm, the, the previous video that I did, not, not the condensed version of this one, but um, uh, about the Thomas Shepard family in Kentucky, I had noticed, there was a noticeable, I pointed out a noticeable relationship. Um, are a few noticeable facts that one that Thomas Shepard um, was father to, to daughters only and so each one of the children would uh, upon their marriage their last name would change and the second thing is is that it appeared on the census records that as these daughters married uh, their husbands simultaneously acquired land and I interpreted that as being him uh, giving money for really his, uh, the future of his daughter and his daughter's family and the husband's there too and of course beneficiary of that as well. Now, in doing my work on uh, the family of Obadiah Johnson and his wife So tired it escapes me. I'm so a family tree maker and look. I think it's Nancy Shepard. Yeah, I should know that. Um, Nancy Shepard. Um, I was trying to get some, basically part of the procedure I was going through was trying to get vital records from anywhere I could find it. And of course that includes looking at gravestone records. Well, I found a set of gravestones for this particular family and what appeared to me uh, and some other members of the family of later generations in a graveyard that was termed at Find a Grave, um, the Johnson Cemetery in McCracken County, Kentucky. And I don't know the exact memorial number of the entirety of the set. Or if if that applies, but if you want to find the records or the photographs of the gravestones that are there and uh, the individuals buried there and what records exist, you, uh, you know, and may be enhanced as a result of this video in part, um, you would go to find a grave and you would search, you would ultimately try to wind your way up to the Johnson, what's called the Johnson Cemetery in McCracken County, Kentucky at find a grave. Um, you can do a search for, you know, um, Rhoda Shepherd Bean, for example, even after this video is done, memorial number 38001718, and she's part of that overall set. And you can click on, she's interned at Johnson Cemetery, and then you can view all the internments there, and you can see the whole list, and there's a list as of today of 43 individuals, I think, uh, my judgment is there could be up to 45. Um, and so I'm gonna go over each one of these interments one by one, but the basic story that I wanna convey moving forward as a result of my last presentation was that there is definitely a connection between um, Everybody that's buried here is a descendant of Thomas Shepard and his his wife, Mary Polly Jones, and um, or, or connected in some either a descendant or a spouse of one of their descendants. And so, um, what I wanted to do is uh, the state that this cemetery is in. And I don't know if it has anything to do with. Local custom, a, um, a 
part of a, a religious, you know, a, 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 you know, a nuance of a religion where they don't get too elaborate on gravestones, or it's just I, I'm not sure why. But the result is is that of all the graves of the 43 graves that are listed here, there are I would say about. A six to a third that have no birth or death dates associated with them at all. There are six or seven graves in which the individual isn't really identified well enough to tell who they are uh, by the face of the gravestone. And there are, there are some that just have a birth and death year and I could provide a little more information about it. And there are, there are a few that are that anybody looking for their ancestor, uh, if they find this record, you know, they have a, f a full set of birth and death dates and some context for their life, even on the gravestone, that'll help, you know, lend the individual to find out more information that they may be seeking that you know, of a, an incomplete record set and help them uh, move on to the next step. So my goal, my um, what I wanted to accomplish is to um, basically identify all these people as fully as possible and provide as full as possible birth and death dates for them and associate with them to other parts of a family tree so people could um, continue with their work. And a part of this process involves looking up a lot of different records from various sources. And um, some of the birth dates here are just going to be uh, the data indicated on the 1900 census. Um, other birth dates are going to come from death certificates, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to start with the first thing, but basically you get the general story, is that all these people are descendants of Thomas Shepard or married to a, a, a child, a grandchild <coughs> of Thomas Shepard. And I'll, I'll say in general that not everybody, it's not a, it's not a complete list of descendants of Thomas Shepard either. I brought my papers here. Um, instead, it is just the individuals that elected, or their family members elected to have them buried there. And there is a wide variety of styles of gravestones here. I'm going to go down the list in alphabetical order as it appears, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to present what either my solution is as I've determined it, and I'm going to present the evidence that I have, or my best guess based on the evidence that I have. And sometimes I don't have any evidence and I just have a guess. <laughs> it's a rarity. And in some cases I don't have a solution. In one case I have I've definitely identified one of the unmarked graves, one of the persons that are buried in one of the unmarked graves, one of three. Um, due to the contents of a death certificate. And then also I should go over this, um, Kentucky death records, uh, what do they contain or what information do I have and what information do I not have? And secondly, have I ever been to this cemetery personally? No, I haven't been to this cemetery personally. My interest in this family, um, or yeah, this, fam this family, is um, I've been working backwards um, on a project and I've reached the stage where I've gotten to Obadiah Johnson and his wife Fanny Lewis and um, of course I was just gathering as many pieces of information as I could and um, part of it is going to look at gravestone records and some of them are pretty plain and I think it would be helpful for other people to have more information about uh, the individuals, because as time goes on, <coughs> they're going to fall further and further out of memory. It'd be harder and harder for people to actually reach this stage, uh, working backwards, uh, assuming that records are in the the state of records don't change that much from now until then. With privacy being such a concern in this day and age, um, 
I think people are going to have a lot of trouble working through this generation when they're doing their genealogy 200 years down the line. So anyway, I'm thinking ahead. And um, this find a grave will definitely be helpful for other people, and I hope to be a small part of some really good work that's already been done. Um, now, death records in Kentucky, and particularly in McCracken County, where the individuals that are all interred, interred here um, died, as, as, as far as I know. I'll point out any exceptions while I do the presentation. Um, in the earliest days uh, that I've seen, of the records that I've seen, uh, there would be a register, uh, like a book, with um, boxes to be filled in by hand, usually done in cursive, of the individual that died, you know, their, their race, their age, male or female, what they died of, and who their parents were, but not where they were interred, and that'll, that'll be a factor. Then, um, between the years 1911, starting in 1911, Kentucky adopted the use of death certificates. It may be surprising to people. Some people think their death certificates as far back as the 1800s. No, especially not in Kentucky. They weren't around until 1911. And those, those death certificates have been released through 1955 or thereabouts. I don't know exactly. And so you can see on the death certificates um, if the informant, the individual who um, provided the information to uh, the governmental authority that <coughs> filed the death certificate away, um, knew the name of the parent, of the parents, the mother, the mother's maiden name, and the father's name and surname, where they were born, uh, the, the, the deceased individual's date of death, the deceased individual's birth date, where they lived, um, when they died, and where they were interred, and on what date they were buried. Um, these were all, you know, the date they were buried isn't so much material, is just, it's a little added piece of information you can put on your, you know, uh, genealogical reports, but basically the other piece of information become, are very material, and in fact, and sometimes, these death records are the only birth records that are existed for these individuals, because the birth records are there, but they didn't, they kind of stop at the end of the 1930s, and they're they're haphazard before that. Uh, probably only to about 1910. There's a gap between 1920 and 1930, I think. I've had some trouble with that. A lot of time, I found the death certificates the best way to figure out when these people were born and place them, and uh, just compare them to the census records and fit them in. But that's a whole other topic. So right now I'm going to start with the top of the list, which started out uh, yesterday before, two days ago, before I made a submission, and I didn't really, wasn't able to really communicate this that well. I just was so tired, it was so late at night, and it's hard to articulate all the facts involved, but um, basically it was originally listed as an Annie Joe Alexander. I had suggested the name as Annie Laurie Amy Johnson Alexander, and I hadn't done the process that I've done for the past few days to gather information up and look at all the facts and compare it to the gravestone and make a judgment after gathering all the facts from a number of a number of sources that you'll see during this presentation. Um, and so I'll just start here with this record. The first thing we want to do is I want to see that this actually comes out somewhat clearly. So here is a printout of the page and now I'm going to explain what I'm missing for records. I'm going to explain what I have, and I'm going to explain the state that it's in in general. So right now, I'm going to say this is proposed and likely to be husband and wife, Joe Alexander, and his wife, born Lori Amy Annie Johnson. Now, i got a larger 
picture of the gravestone to be a little more illustrative. Okay, so I believe it to be Lori Annie Amy Johnson, born February 1879. I got that from the 1900 census. At least the February part I got from the 1900 census. Died 23 June 1958. And because uh, Lori Annie Amy Johnson Alexander his death certificate uh, was produced after 1955. I don't have the privilege of examining it to determine what it, where it says her burial interment was. Same with Joe Alexander, who I believe it to be 28th June 1874 to 30 Jan January 1959, or birth and death dates, and I believe it's two people. If you look at this and you go, hey, you know, Maybe it could be. Now, I've already discussed the limitations. <laughs> here are my pre preliminary findings of fact. I'll do a little better job discussing it here. In the 1880 census, which I'll retrieve and show you in a second, uh, she appears as a Lori A, age 1, birth year 1879. In the 1900 census, she is actually married and he uses the name Amy Alexander, and she's married to Joe Alexander. And um, she's in the same household in which she was in the 1880 census, and that is um, with Obadiah Johnson and, no, actually just with Nancy, because Obadiah and Nancy had divorced by 1900, but with all the same siblings. I know I followed this, uh, this family from 1870 to 1880, then to 1900, there is no 18, there is no 1890 census. It was burned and destroyed, and uh, it says that she was born in February 1879. Although that particular census record, whoever took it, had very sloppy writing, poor spelling skills, and not the best precision. But I gather it was. It seems to me, at least, he noted the month. And um, then, when I look at, there is a Kentucky death index that expands beyond the 1955, and it goes pretty late. In fact, uh, the, the ones between 1955 and, say, roughly 1980, because I don't know enough about it, when this changed, but after 1980, they, they provide the name, the um, the name of the mother with mother's maiden name. But in between times, they only just have the individual and the date they died and their age, and you have to subtract it out to figure out what year they were born in. But anyway, by doing so, it gives a, a birth, year of birth of 1879. Her husband, Joe Alexander, filed um, for the draft for World War One, and he has a birth year that's mid-1874, when you do the rounding on these censuses, it can, somehow, can sometimes come out as 1875. And then in between 1910 and 1930, again, each year they always say, with the exception of a one-year variance in, I think, 1930, that, um, that they were born in 1879 and 1875. And they were living together each each of those three times. So the facts are that we know that there is an uh, Joe Alexander had a wife named Annie who is listed as the daughter of Nancy Shepard, 1900, making her Annie uh, Nancy Johnson then because she was married, uh, making her Annie Johnson, and that we've been I've been able to reinforce the birth and death dates through outside records, and they were living together at least through 1930, and I believe they're, that's where they're buried, and that's my basis. Now, what am I missing? I'm missing an actual death certificate that says they were buried at a Shepherd or Johnson or Wallace or McNeil or Harper Cemetery. All, those are all names given to this one particular cemetery that I'm going to be uh, doing at uh, the, doing doing this for, 
And you will see that on various death certificates that, that, I, that I've retrieved, and those, of course, are death certificates that lie between 1911 and around 1955. Don't quote me on the 1955, but it's around that time. Okay, so I said I was going to look at census records. So where they appear, and I knew a little further down here, I kind of had to have it out of order. Or I could just pick up, here it is. Okay, so this is the 1900, this is a transcription of the 1900 census. It's going to be easier for you to read this than uh, to read this. <laughs> but basically, I've examined it, and the contents of the transcription reflect the contents of what is handwritten there. And at the bottom there, you can see that there is a Joe, Alexander, and an Amy. Now, on the census, I really should have written this in, he's listed as a son-in-law. And this is the daughter, and you notice that her last name is shown as Alexander here. But it says that she's single, <laughs> which is more of a reflection on the accuracy of the census taker than anything else. And listed in this, just to, to be assured, you know, this is after uh, Obadiah Johnson and Nancy Shepard had divorced, but to reinforce the, you know, uh, legitimacy that these people are properly placed in this family, I, I'll tell you right now that James, Ed, Joel, Lisa, Liza, Emmett, all those individuals are siblings of um, Laura Amy, as she's shown uh, on the 1880 and 1870 censuses. Um, although some of these couldn't appear until later, they're born later, they're, they're all the siblings of her. And that's, that's shown through their census records, so I know that's them. This is Edward Alexander. You can only pick one person to be the subject. I happened to be, when I printed this out, I was looking for Edward Alexander, which is the son of Joe and, and Annie, and I'll get to, to him, where, where would he fit in if he does it all, um, eventually, and Johnny Alexander will come up, <coughs> but um, this is their, their family in 1910. They moved out. At that time, they had two children, and in this sentence, census, uh, one important thing that is asked of uh, the mother is uh, how many children are you the mother of and how many are still living? And her answer was two and two, and so that throws a monkey wrench in one of the records, one of the gravestones that I'll discuss. And I don't even know if you'll even be able to see this, if even if I found it. I should have highlighted this. Yeah, it's hard to read. I don't know if you can see that two and two. I'll circle it. <laughs> but she says two and two there, and that's where um, th that'll be that'll be an important factor. And then here they are in 1920, living with their son, Edward. And finally, there's there they are in 1930, just living alone, still in Paducah. And then here's their son's record, which will which will play a factor in another part of the presentation. I'm going to say, and I'm going to talk about, because there is a James H. who later gets married. Okay, so let's work our way back here. Again, here's just so we have some reinforcement for the dates that I'm proposing for these two individuals. Look, Ma, no hands. Um, I have, here's Annie L., which would be for Laura. Uh, that's her death date. And gives an age of 79. There's 1879, the February I got for the 1900 census. Here's Joe's death date, 84. There's 1875, but I have more precision on his birth date from the World War I draft registration card here. It's shown 28 June 1874, and 
in this, it would be hard to see, I guess, yeah, you can see that. Um, he has a wife named Annie, he says. He was a Paducah, and there's his birth date that he provides. And so, that is gravestone number one of 43, but this, um, again, I believe that's two into two people. The proof would lie in examining the death certificates for sure, but I have uh, very strong evidence to, to believe what I what I propose here. Now this right here is it says Joe Ed Alexander, and you'll notice and it'll be a little clearer on the larger graystone that I'm going to show here that um, there is a period in between the Joe and Ed, and it's not exactly the dash of the husband and wife that I propose, but it's close. It could be, you know, I think it could be two people. There's a reason why that dot's there, and I think it's... Now, uh, another thing that I want to comment on, there's two other things I want to comment on, and one thing I mentioned last night was that I hope between the effort that I'm making here and the effort that is has been made by an individual named find <laughs> I'm not gonna find it, am I? Okay. There is a <clears throat> there's a film at the Family History Library. Okay, the, so what the Mormons do is they collect genealogical records, and they microfilm them, and then they make them available to you at the Family History Center. If you go down to your local basically Mormon church, there'll be a little library somewhere on that, on the grounds, and in that library you can go and you can order microfilm by microfilm number. And if I hadn't lost track of what that microfilm number was, but I do mention it in the other presentation that I do, um, you can order a transcription that was made by somebody a number of years ago that may answer questions that I'm unable to answer in my presentation here. Between that and my presentation and those little boxes that appear here up on the top, um, that they may also provide information that I don't have. So right now my best guess is, is the reason why I can't find a death record for Joe and Ed Alexander is because those deaths took place between 1902 and 1910, maybe even sooner, 1909 actually, and I, I, I just believe that these are two children that died young, young, um, uh, they're children of the individuals we just discussed, Joe Alexander and his wife Laura Amy Annie Shepard, and that when she was asked about um, her. Um, number of children that were born to her and number of children still living. Either the census taker didn't present the question right, it was misunderstood. It would have to be that for this to be true, is what I'm saying. Um, and so that's one guess I have. The second guess I have is that they did have a son named Ed Alexander, uh, but never, never did I see in that any of his records that, I, that I've seen uh, him go by by Joe first, spell his name with E D D, or spell his name with E D D, and I probably could try to find, look, and see if I can find a burial inscription for him somewhere. Uh, I think I think he died after the death certificates stopped being released, so I can't make a determination that way. I can't make an eliminative determination. And the one part of the presentation that I missed last night was uh, presenting the eliminative evidence. And I'll, I hope to go into that today too. Um, <clears throat> so this also could be uh, their son, Edward D. Alexander, and um, if it's not, and if it, and if Edward D. Alexander is buried in this Shepherd, in this Shepherd Johnson, <laughs> McNeil, Harper, Wallace Cemetery. Um, as it's named on death certificates, then he could be one of the unmarked graves. So, okay, so let's just show. This is the Edward Alexander I'm talking about here. 
because his birthday, death date, January 1973, so I'm not going to have the luxury of seeing his death certificate. There's the exact date, died in McCracken County. I might be able to get further information on it, but I, I so far with <laughs> I've done, you know, I've, I've covered a basic scope for each one of these, and I haven't dug further in the ones that aren't resolved yet. I may have a supplemental video for it, I'm not sure. The next grave is for a Johnny Alexander, and that I've determined uh, definitely that this is another son of um, Joe Alexander and his wife, Amy Laurie <laughs> Annie Johnson. And the reason why the death of this son does not play a factor into the, um, the, the contradictory evidence to my theory from the 1910 census where she says he's only had two children, both are living, is that uh, he died after 1910. <laughs> he died in 1910, and probably just a few days after the census takers left, um, or a couple months. And so what I do have for this grave is just a little bit more precision on his birth and death dates. And so I've determined this to be, John yes, Johnny Alexander, as Johnny as he was called, probably John. And um, there is... And these are the death registers. Uh, coming up are the death registers that I'm talking about. And it doesn't have an internment site. So it's a little more difficult to read. I've highlighted the entry, but you're probably not going to be able to see it uh, from this camera in the presentation. But it does say... Now, uh, JNO is actually an abbreviation for John for whatever reason. And I'm not so sure there's really an F in that record when I've looked at it closely. Uh, it could just be a couple of dots after the John. Someone thinks they're being fancy or whatnot. There's the death date, but in the death register itself, it says that the individual was nine months old. I don't think you're going to be able to see that. So that's where I get the August 1909 and his death date, 29 May 1910. Next gravestone. Just freaking me, huh? And I got a big thick. A couple packs here, so we ain't done yet. <coughs> now, if you're waiting to see whether I found your ancestor's record and can provide more information, I'll tell you right now before we get too deep into this, and you have to wait all the way to the end to find out that I didn't. Um, that the the individual that I wanted, well, the individual that I believe is in one of the three marked graves. Before I get to this next one, is Josephine Lofton Harper. Just born Josephine Lofton, married a uh, Harper. So, uh, if you're not looking for that individual and you, and you think your person might be buried at this, and, and you're going to get more information from the presentation, you know, sorry, I guess you can stop now unless you know you think you more you can get more ancillary inf uh, pieces of information that'll help. Um, man, I don't want to waste your time. Okay, so here's the next individual and. It's listed as a Myrtle Alexander, but I've determined this to be Myrtle Rust Alexander. And I have additional precision also in the form of birth and death dates. And these are the dates I believe her to be uh, born 22nd of September 1924, died 18 January 1988, and she married Edward S. Alexander son of Joe Alexander and Amy, Amy Laura Amy Johnson and uh, she was the daughter of Henry Rust I'll show where I get that information from the basic facts are that um, Edward S Johnson there Edward S Alexander Here's in the Alexander household and leaves in 1930. I've shown those census records previously. And then um, marries someone named Orlear as index, indexed in the census. And then one of the children in that 1930 census is a James H. Alexander. And I've in this packet of information, I have his marriage record with Myrtle Rust. And her death record is listed in the SSDI that determine, that's how I determine her birth and death dates. So, if I don't have an internment confirmation in this case, 
but I have a very strong set of evidentiary matter to substantiate uh, the claim I'm making there. So here's a marriage record between, this is a transcribed edition of a marriage record between James Alexander and Myrtle Rust, and what seems to throw things off is that they got married in Missouri. Um, but we'll see from additional records that we're going to look at that they definitely both were from Paducah. Uh, so why they got married in Missouri, I don't know, but that's besides the point. So here is a marriage license that's probably going to be too blurry if I get too close, too small if I get too far away, but basically what the license says is, is that there's a license between James H. Alexander of Paducah, County of McCracken, Kentucky, age of 18 years, and Myrtle Rust of Melbourne in the County of McCracken, State of Kentucky, of 17 years. And it says that Mrs. S. E. Alexander, mother of James Alexander, and Mrs. Henry Rust, mother of Myrtle Rust, both assent in writing to this marriage in the presence of notaries. And so they get a marriage license as a result. That's, those were the laws of Missouri at the time this marriage took place. And just a little more detail. This is the other half of the marriage record as it's transcribed. There's Myrtle Rust. Here is a note written by Myrtle Rust's mother, calling herself Mrs. Henry Rust, unfortunately, so we don't know her first name. Um, and there's the date, basically saying, yeah, it's cool, get married. <laughs> Notary at the bottom. Here's her Social Security death index record that gives me the birth and, mer birth and death dates for that record. And the Kentucky Death Index reinforces that with the same death date. McCracken County, of course this has McCracken County too, it wasn't necessarily, I really didn't need to show that. These are the census records I looked over, and again, just reviewing Joe and Amy Alexander living in the household, of uh, the Johnson household in 1900, and Edward and Johnny continuing in 1910, and her saying she had two children, both of which are living. And then 1920, Johnny is gone, so he's dead. That confirms what I found in the death registers. No more questions about how many children and number of children living, unfortunately, in that census or in the 1930 census when they're living together. But in each one of these years, he uh, gives an 1875 birth year, and she gives an 1879 or 80 birth year. And then there is Edward Alexander. There's his son, James H., appearing in the 1910 census, age of six. So he must have gotten married probably four years after the 1920 census was taken. That's my guess, and hey, we got a marriage record, so why am I saying must have when, let's just look and see if this record shows four years after. Well, it took them two years to have their first child, but you kind of see where some of the guesswork gets close to actuality when you look at all these different records together. Okay, next individual. Rhoda Shepherd Bean. It took me a long while. In fact, my first presentation, I hadn't identified who she had married. I finally have identified who she is married. And I have no proposed changes, of course, to her name. It, you know, she was born to be Rhoda. She was born Rhoda Shepherd, married Mr. Bean. So the way he presented not find a grave, exactly Rhoda Shepherd Bean, Shepherd in italics. Uh, but I add some dates here, not exactly precise. I still haven't found her death record. Unfortunately, I think it lies, the evidence shows me it lies between 1900 and 1910, and from the 1900 census, I got a birth year and month of February 1848, and the preponderance of evidence tells me her birth year is 1848. Um, she's in the Thomas Shepard household between 1850 and 1860. And I might as well get that now. Stack. Yes, I'm making noise. I'm 
getting something in. I hope I won't take too long. Meanwhile, I could make up a commercial for you. Bogus commercial for you to listen to. Or, here we go. All right. And then there's... This is basically the way I have it set up now. It evolves over time. Okay, so dealing with Rhoda. I've got her here, number six. But on the front, I have the census records. 1850 to 60. So there she is. Um, there. Birth year 1847, and that is the 1860 census and 1850 census. With uh, she's not yet named Shepherd, two years old, uh, in the 1850 census. Now, one thing I should go over is a part of the proof of um, my general assertion is that Thomas Shepard ended up granting his land to all the families that ended up being uh, all of his daughters and, and their families. Uh, here is just this is a, this is a summary of what what happened. So I don't as of now I don't know what happened to Muriel Shepard. Okay, I think she's Sister Shepard, and we'll get to her in this graveyard. Um, Mary, Margaret Lavina ended up marrying Thomas Jones Wallace, who's buried as Jones Wallace, and we'll get to him. But keep these names in mind, and I'm going to uh, give you a glance and a look at the different census records that appear, and you'll see these names appear over time where they weren't there before, and you'll see that the land has been given away to these various families. And then, uh, the one family that doesn't really seem to stick around or have their children buried uh, in the area is... <coughs> Did I have that wrong? For this is um, the daughter Elizabeth, who also called herself a Tinza later, who was married to a William Dunway and a Brad Lovelace first. Um, I don't have any evidence of their presence in that graveyard. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that I've got the, the right person, but I'm going to relook at it. Uh, I'm certain about Sarah Ann Jeroma Shepard and that she married Blaney Harper, and that Rhoda Shepard married John Bean, that's what we're on. And Laura Mina is just simply buried there, and she's, not, she's listed as Laura Shepard. We'll get to that. Now let's take a look at these censuses. Here in... What order, which direction am I going? Okay, let's start from the earliest days. And I'll explain these land grants a little better, also. I probably should have done all this stuff first, but... This is where I am. Okay, so let's see, can we see this? Yes, okay, so there's a database in Ancestry that basically has taken the contents of a book pretty large. Um, what had happened is is around 1820, if I have this right, there's a portion of Kentucky that's far, the, the far west, the farthest west portion of Kentucky uh, that is on the west side of the Tennessee River was at one point entirely controlled and owned by the Choctaw Indians. And Andrew Jackson went over there as a negotiator, not as president yet, and ended up buying that land from the Indians. And then it was later given away in what's called land grants, but these it wasn't just given to the people. They actually had to buy this land from the government. And um, the, the list of the individuals that had bought land are, are compiled in a book called the Kentucky Land Grants are available at some libraries uh, in whole or part. Um, this happens to be chapter 7. So, uh, But anyway, that the entirety of those books has been compiled and is incorporated into records at Ancestry.com. And if you're not familiar with the record, it just looks like a useless piece of trivia. But th in this case, it actually helps uh, with the entire bit of information. So. What this says, and I'm going to try to do this a little better than I did last night at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
Okay, now how do you use this information? It doesn't give you a year, it just says there's a Thomas Shepard and he bought some land and some quarter section and that doesn't translate into census records. What do you do with it? Well, um, and if you want to look up the original record, you can go get the book and look at page 869. Nonetheless, okay, so there is a actually a Kentucky Land Office website. You can search for Kentucky Land Office in Google and the, this result will come up. And there's a bunch of, on the, on the left hand side of the web page, there, there are a lot of um, different links, but the link you're looking for in this case are the database searches. And you click on that, and then you have to, you, you further have to look into it. You have to say, I want to look at the west of the Tennessee River non-military patents for this particular record. <laughs> and I'm not an expert at all of these things, but this one I happen to know, so I'm going to share. And you can search my name. You can search by a patent number or receipt number, but that isn't provided here. The name's provided, but there may be more than one Thomas Shepard. But the, the, the surefire way to get the record you're looking for is to use the quarter section location, quarter section number, township range, and east and west. And you know, what, how am I going to know that? Well, you get that from this book. And for quarter section location, that would be this 26 right here. And for quarter section number in fact, I don't think you even know, need to know the quarter section location I put in the quarter section number of 26 for the township I put in 6 am I getting that? yes and then for the range I put in 2 and then for the east west I put east and what came up was this result, and if you click on the images link, you can see the original documents. It was quite neat. So, what ended up happening in this case is that there is a man named Jonas Mullins who had originally bought the piece of land, and then he ended up selling it to Thomas Shepard on. Thursday, February 28, 1839 for $20. So he bought 160 acres for 20 bucks, which is cheaper than what they got it for up in Wisconsin. If you had to pay like $200 for 40 acres or something like that. Um, so let's look at the original records, shall we? Okay, so I kind of got them out of order. This is the first original purchase that took place. Uh, when Jonas Mullins had bought this land in 1829. On the back it is endorsed and I guess you can barely see that with the camera but basically it says <coughs> was granted 12th February 1840 to Thomas Shepard. And then on the front it has uh, the name of the governor, it's got Thomas Shepard, it's just got, you know, 160 acres. Anyway. That's the only documents really related that I see right here, right now. Um, there may be more information on this website. There are some wills that are actually the original, or um, some close to original documents are actually scanned and up on, on that site that you can look that shows how uh, the land was passed to other individuals and I may just want to do that to reinforce what I what the evidence has clearly shown me and, and that is that Thomas Shepard willed if willed or and or granted his land to his daughters for their family's use okay so I'm telling the story of Thomas Shepard then the next thing that I see is that he appears right in the 1840 census and I kind of screwed this up in the middle of the night I got confused but basically it's got Thomas Shep. All the 1840 census shows are the number of individuals, whether they're male and female, and what date range of birth, of what age range that they are in. And so I applied the the um, birth 
and the birth dates that I knew about to this 1840 census, and I placed Thomas Shepard in <coughs> the range and matched him up to the one individual that's shown to be a free, free white male, age 30 39, because his uh, birth date has always been 1801 or 1800. And then um, for free white persons that are female under five, I've actually I matched it up to Nancy Ellen Shepard, who was born between 1836 and 40, and then the second one is from Margaret Lavinia Shepard, who appears prominently in the cemetery. Her date range is, is good, and there's um, Mary Polly Jones, the mother, who also is in the right date range. She says 1810 all the time. Okay, so now let's show how this land was divided up. In the beginning, in 1850, some of the neighbors here <coughs> that I see, you know, let's look at this. There's Thomas and Mary, and their oldest daughter, Mary L., and then Margaret living with them. So no one has moved out. He's got the entirety of, of his land here. And um, the Rotas, they're not yet named. It's hard to read, but nonetheless. Okay, this is the 1850 census. By the 1860 census, who appears but uh, Sarah Harper as an owner of land and a Henry Blaney, sorry, Blaney Harper, you can't even see it on the camera, and a William Lofton and also a Thomas and Obadiah Johnson appear. So just by looking at land records, I can tell and if I had known beforehand that these were the daughters of Thomas Shepard and that he only had daughters, I would have, um, I'd be able, I could tell you right now analytically, that's what I mean by analytics, that, that um, Sarah mar married Mr. Harper between 1860 and 1870, Blaney Harper, and Nancy married Obadiah Johnson between 1860 and 1870. Okay, so let's look. There's Nancy Shepard. At the end of the day, I've determined that she. I got a. I actually found a marriage record that they married on 9th August 1861, and for Blaney Harper, there's the marriage record. 67. Now, Margaret Lavinia Shepard would have already married Thomas Jones Wallace between 1850 and 1860. I'm gonna see because I see him as a neighbor later on. And actually, yes, there it is. There's this right here is actually I'm going to highlight. It says J. P. Wallace, and there is his wife, Mary Lavinia. And so she's not in this household, but she was in the 1840 census, although uh, 1850 census. So that's analytically again. Um, that reinforces the record that I found. And also, this is, you know, proving out what my basic assertion is, is that, you know, the family divided the land up. I don't have the benefit of the 1890 census. In fact, I can't even find an 1880 census for Thomas Shepard, but I do have, because they're living in the same area, Obadiah Johnson's, you know, Obadiah Johnson's pack. censuses because that's when he was living with Nancy Shepard when he had the land and she stays there after the divorce he goes elsewhere which is another reinforcing factor so here's 1880 they're calling it Hausers at this time and next to him it's hard to see but there is a Tom not intended. Thomas Wallace. Nancy Harper. Lavinia, his wife. Blaney Harper and Sarah, his wife. All living there. Now, what's apparent from all this is that <coughs> Elizabeth, who married Lovelace and Dunway, didn't stay for whatever reason. Okay, so that's the, this. This pretty much I've shown that he's divided his land up. 
So now I'm going to go ahead and continue with this. So here's Rhoda Shepherd, and she appeared in the 1850 and 1860 census. And I believe her dates to be February 1848. And she died somewhere between 1900 and 1910. I don't have the benefit of the death record. It's the gap I was discussing before. And um, she married John C. Bean. He died in De uh, December 1910. Uh, it says he's a widower. And I don't know where he's buried, but if he's buried in this cemetery, then he is... Um, also a one of the unmarked graves and so John Bean I have her marrying him wrong family 1865 so on the 1870 census I should see her living with him in one of the pieces of land it was formerly Thomas Shepherds. They're all living together. Is this yes, 1870? Hmm. Now, that deal might not have applied to her either. So, yeah, I'd really like to see a will, but in general, that's the rule. I can't tell whether by bay here it means bean or what. I don't see a rhoda here, or rhodi, as she was called later. So maybe they sold it? They, they got their portion, so I don't know. So, um, anyway. And I'm getting too many details now. I hope to continue. So, there is their marriage record, John C. Bean and Rhoda Shepherd, just to show that that's who it was. This is a birth record of their daughter that was born, and they're calling, in a lot of the records she's being called Rhody <laughs> instead of Rhoda. Uh, this Lenona, Leonona, ended up calling herself Sarah, I believe, and I believe they're descendants of her living somewhere. And from searches I've done, there were some results that seemed to indicate that was what happened, but I'm not sure. Here's the death record for John C. Bean. Of course, that is only showing up on these handwritten things, and I don't hear it. It says he's widowed. So it tells me she was dead before then, and this is just their census records living together. I don't know if there are any other beans that are buried at that cemetery, but if there are other beans buried at the cemetery, they're one of the unmarked graves. So one way to pursue additional possibilities is to look into all of their children. Now, in the first year they were together, in fact, they went to Callaway County, Kentucky. That's why we're not finding them on that page. Um, so whatever reason he wasn't really enticed by land to marry her <coughs> these those three are, the rest are his siblings on this page so that's not going to tell you the answer you're looking for this here is now his family and they are now they're back but they're in Greaves County um, which very well could have been, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what he was doing in Grace County. I mean, maybe I should look up his record. But, again, possibilities of individuals that may be buried in that cemetery, if we can find death records for them, and I haven't so far, and I've spent a good amount of time on it, are Eva Bean, John T. Bean, Sarah L. Bean, that was the Lamona that I found the birth record for, and this is not Mark, this is actually Mac. Mac, Bean, and, and Hattie. If we can find death records for any of them and see they're buried at a Hauser, Wallace, Shepherd, Johnson Cemetery, any of those, then we'll know who some additional people are for the unmarked graves. Besides looking in those little glass cases, <laughs> which I would encourage. 
uh, you to, to do, and I'll get to that when we get there. Here's just some more records of them. Now, Talima Deweese, as I mentioned in my summarized version, I have a strong belief that she is, or he, <laughs> if it's a he, a husband of a um, person that's 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 now living or a child of a person that's now living and I gathered this information by the amalgamation of of a of a um, obituary for Mary Hopkins that appears in the Paducah Sun and uh, a story about how Abby Abby McNeil that was posted in Ancestry, and basically those two together work to tell me that this Talima DeWeese is of a relation of the Nancy DeWeese that is mentioned in Mary Hopkins' uh, obituary as a daughter. I don't have exact dates for birth or death for Talima, so I can't speak more of it, but I do know that people that are living, when they go to the cemetery, know who Talima is, uh, because this obituary is written in 2010, and it's probably within someone's memory who Talima was, and so it's basically, as of now, um, identifying exact birth and death dates for this individual, which I can't anyway. Um, it's not going to solve a genealogical mystery at this point, but uh, 200 years from now, it's going to be a different story. So I, you know, a word of encouragement to put up a little marker or something on the side, maybe just just say when she was born and when she died, maybe helpful for future researchers. In as much as that they may be looking for who Talima Deweese's parents were because the only clue they have is that Talima Deweese was a cousin of this individual. <laughs> the, the, the way clues arrive in genealogy are, are very extensive. Which is one of my motivations for doing this. This next one is actually Mary Ann Wallace Garvey. And I have that additional information, and I also have, um, yes, exact birth and death dates for her. So, I believe her to be Marianne Wallace Garvey, uh, born 13 September 1859, dying 15 December 1918, and the facts are that Margaret Lavinia Shepard, who's the daughter of Thomas Shepard and, and Mary Polly Jones, married Thomas Wallace, she has a very large gravestone in this graveyard. And she had a daughter named Mary Ann who married George Garvey. And they later divorced, but the death certificate and census, uh, death certificate shows the dates of her birth and death, and the census uh, shows that she married George Garvey. So here is the death record as far as transcriptions are concerned. And what will follow will be, I think, the first death record, I'm gonna, death certificate I'm going to go through here. And as I get to each one, I'm going to point out where they say the, the, sec, the, the cemetery is. And we'll find out at the end of this what it's mostly being called and the variety of names that the cemetery is being called. So uh, there you are. There's Marianne Wallace, mother Margaret L. Shepard, and father Thomas Wallace. He's buried as Jones Wallace of this yard, by the way. Um, there's her birth and her death dates, and they're calling this a Johnson Cemetery in this case. That's not going to hold true, I'll tell you that. Here is the only census record that let me identify who her husband was, and that's the 1900 census, and it's George Garvey. They got married in 1899. By that census, I don't have a marriage record out of that county. And then it shows her is divorced in 1910, living with <coughs> the Loftons, who were, I think, uh, Roberta Lofton was her sister. And Roberta Lofton was the daughter of Thomas Wallace, and I'll show that later. The next one I have 
no further information to provide. Well, yeah, a little bit. A little bit further information to provide about her name. In various records she went by, as I showed in the last video that I did, she went by both Anne and Jeroma. Okay. And <coughs> Harper, yes, I, I agree with. And here are the findings of facts that I have so far. Thomas Shepard and Mary Polly Jones had a daughter. Her name was Siri, Sarah Sally Ann Jeroma by the amalgamation of all the records I see her with. And she married Blaney Harper. And I showed that on when I first looked at the census records, there was a na neighbor, Blaney Harper. Um, <coughs> and here are the Here's the Kentucky marriage record as transcribed and put into um, at Ancestry.com, 1867, and I showed how that made sense because he showed, appeared suddenly with some land there uh, next to Tom, next to the Shepherd household between 1860 and 1870. Here is her death record. Uh, birth and death dates are supplied. Father Thomas Shepard, Mother Polly Jones, and that was material for the line I was studying, the fact that it was Jones and not James is the last name. And in this case, they're calling this a Harper Cemetery. It's hard to read, but <coughs> the only reason why I know that says Harper is because I know <laughs> her last name's Harper. I wouldn't have known otherwise. It almost looks like Hausers or something, um, which they did which some of her relatives lived at Hauser's, but no, it, it, it's, she's buried there. I mean, she's got a gravestone, so there you are. Okay, so now she may have been moved, but I doubt it. Here just happens to be the census record between Blaney Harper and her in 1870, and she's got three children that Arthur L., the L stands for Lef Lafayette, and William Lofton, it's not indicated in the 1870 census what the relation was, I don't think. Uh, no, but <coughs> that William Lofton is definitely a relation to her um, sister. It's probably her sister's son. Here's 1880. There's Lafayette. There's Robert. Here's 1900. Again, living in one of the households that divides the land. And she owns one of two lots, actually, in 1910. Or, no, she is widowed. Bellini is gone. He died between 1900 and 1910, but I... And so, here's 1920. Her living on her own with her children. Here's the here's a death record for her son, who names Bellini Harper as her father, and that's how I was originally able to find out about who, who, what Sarah's name would have been when she died. Okay, the next one is um, this Ma Johnson baby. I tried looking, and I just cannot find anything definitive. There are a few records in Ancestry with an M.A. Johnson that died, but they were in a completely different county, and I have yet to connect the relationship to this family, to this individual. You know, if it's a baby, it may escape, you know, it's, it's almost likely to escape uh, from, uh, being shown up in the census for one. And based on the gaps in some of the death records, this person probably died between 1900 and 1910, but who's to know? The next one is Carl E. Johnson. And um, I've got a little bit more of an exact date, that is all. And he and some context is that he was the son of Ollie James Johnson and Beatrice Hopkins. And Ollie James Johnson was the son of Joel Joe Joseph, his first name, middle name Anderson, last name Johnson. And he was the son of Obadiah Johnson. That's also the line that I'm following back uh, from the subject individuals that I'm working on now. Uh, I have these exact birth dates as 25th September 1934 to 6th November 1935. And um, the main identifier between this individual 
and the expanded death dates that I have is, is actually the death certificate. And in this case, they're calling it a shepherd's cemetery. It's hard to see, but, and, you know, birth and death, I guess, if you want a better look. There it is. Father Ollie Johnson, Mother Beatrice Hopkins. Next one's Claude E. Johnson, and what's unfortunate about this is that I, I I'm going to say I, I swear on the Bible that I've, at one point, had lost, you know, I had, had found the record for this Claude, and it was in an, in an unusual form, in that I might have been in a birth register only or a death register only, and therefore, I, I you know, I haven't been able to find it since. I don't know where I got it. It's um, I had first done some preliminary research, brought the, the documentation home, and then since that time I have um, uh, started from scratch and rebuilt, and I, this is the only record I have not found from all those. Nonetheless, um, this uh, ended up being listed either by other members of the family that are saying this was Claude Estelle Johnson that was born 11 May 1902 and died July in 1902, or I had a record that said that, but I don't have it anymore. This is not much of a material assertion, and, and the one thing to know about this individual is it was a daughter of Joe Joseph Jewel Anderson Johnson and Fanny Lewis. that gives you some context to who that was. <clears throat> the next one was a, a find that I hadn't seen before, just like um, Myrtle Rust, who became Myrtle Alexander. This answer I haven't seen yet, and so this will help enhance some of the family trees that are out there. I'm a one-man show here. <laughs> I literally just pick up the camera and hold it <laughs> and talk. <clears throat> okay, so here is listed as Cordy Johnson. She's born Cordy Diedrich, and that information is derived from the 1920 census when she and her husband Ed are living with, as listed, uh, in relation to Ed Johnson, a mother-in-law and a sister-in-law, and their last name was Diedrich. So that's the only thing I really have to add there. And um, let's go over here. And we, I think she's got a full death date there, right? So I don't think the death index information is going to do much. Here is the 1920 census in which the Diedrichs appear. They're in Graves County. And. Again, Ed Johnson is a son of Joe Joseph Joel Anderson Johnson and Fanny Lewis, if I didn't mention that. And for whatever reason, they're in Graves County for a little bit. And it says, Father's birthplace is Pennsylvania. I've never seen that. So they're in this situation, they're saying that Basically saying that Joseph Joel Joel Anderson was born in Pennsylvania. That's a mismatch. In that sense, I've never never heard of that. Could be a mistake on the on the census taker's part. I'm going to look further into this Ed D. Johnson, but I'm pretty pretty sure that in fact in here. This is Cordy, who's now father's birthplace is Maryland instead of Ohio. But if I can find Edward, he doesn't assert Pennsylvania here. He, he goes back to Kentucky, Tennessee, and North Carolina, as I would expect. This is the 1910 census. So I'm not, and that's not really material to these gravestones, but there they are living together. Okay, so this was actually Edward. D. Johnson, and uh, yes, I've identified who she was. She's Cordy Diedrich, and here's Ever D. Johnson, and 
Oh, was wrong. <laughs> Edward D. Johnson was the son of Obadiah and Nancy Shepard. <laughs> and he's seen in, the, in their household in the 1900, 1870, and 1880 censuses. No, <coughs> I have really no suggested enhancement to anything else in this record other than he is Edward D as shown in this 1920 census and even though that one says Ed see they they, they, they just <laughs> they play hot potato they play hot potato with their names but there's your Edward in 19. <laughs> yeah, through that. Okay, the next one is Fanny Lewis Johnson. That's the enhancement I have, and I have enhanced, enhanced birth and death dates to include the month and the day. Okay, so she was originally born Fanny Lewis, and I think I have some around here. They're She's the daughter of Monroe Lewis and Anna Ellen Starnes. Here is their pack. And in their pack, Fanny, I have as number five. In the 1900 census, someone's calling her Lance. Someone else called Lloyd, Lloyd Lord, so go figure. In the... years do I have Fanny showing up? I don't go into that that much. Fanny is only actually in the 1900 census. There's an Anna E. Lewis, and that's Anna Ellen Starnes, and I guess I'll present more information there. Now, the one record that connects her back to her parents, Monroe Lewis, is not just my chart, but it's the fact that um, her, her sister, Rossi Pearl Jeffrey, who, over a number of years, um, includes Oscar in her household in um, 1900, and in 1910, she includes her brother Terry in the household. This one was hard to put together, but I did. Um, <coughs> her death certificate identifies her mother as Anna Ellen Starnes and her father as um, Henry Starnes. And that, that, that allows me to go back further on that, <coughs> that record. I don't see a change in the mother. It's always Anna E. So that's how he's able to place her. She, her exact dates are 20 March 1884 through 19 August 1975. And because um, she's she died that late. I don't have the benefit of, but not late enough to, to have the mother's ma mother's name and maiden name listed. I, I can't tell from her by the records just directly related to her that her, those were her parents, but I did through her sister who died in 1933. Um, here's her marriage to a Joel A. in, in uh, 1900 in Illinois. Massa County, Illinois is the neighboring County. It's the southernmost county in Illinois. It's just right above McCracken, but over the border in Illinois. Why they got married there, I don't know. Same, and I don't know why the other couple got married in Missouri, but them's the facts. And that's what what happened. Here are now Fanny ended up remarrying <coughs> after Joel died, but she's buried in a tombstone that says just Fanny Johnson. So actually. Um, her name on Find a Death should be Fanny Lewis Johnson Lindsay. The Lewis, spelled L E W I S, should be the one in italics. This is her death record. The birth date matches up with her birth record in the census that she appears. And 
again, Kentucky Death Index, reinforcing that. But again, I don't have the death certificate that's going to say she was buried in this yard, but I know she was. This is the second husband. I don't know where he was buried. I guess he lived at Marshall. Died in 71, so I can't see where he was buried. There's his exact birth and death dates, but it doesn't, it doesn't apply to this presentation. I don't know why I had it in there. Here's the death certificate for Rossi Pearl Jeffrey that proves <laughs> um, that Fannie Lewis's parents were Monroe Lewis and Anna Starnes from Tennessee. Transcription of. She was buried at Mount Kenton, so she doesn't appear in this census. And then this is just their. And in the one year that she appears, they got her as Lance, but she's really Fanny. And again, it's this census taker with this chicken scratch that went through uh, Kentucky that just ruined, didn't really ruin everything, made it a little more difficult. The next individual is George, George Emmett Johnson. And his grandson has a very nice presentation up at Ancestry.com. <clears throat> so there are, I'll show a few items from that presentation. He identifies them as George, so I have no, the only real enhancement I'd have to this is to say it is George. And he's the son of Obadiah Johnson and Nancy Ellen Shepherd. And the facts are revealed by the death certificate, which is here. I've transcribed there. In this case, they're saying he was buried at Shepherd Cemetery. And amongst these photos, I'll read the story, but here's the photograph. I'm getting this. Yes, okay. My grandfather was a motorman for the Paducah Transportation Company. My memory tells me that he is the second man from the left in the first row. Maybe him? Um, the picture is taken from the book, Paducah, A Pictural History, by Johnny L. Robertson. I had the privilege of taking history lessons under Dr. Robertson when I attended Paducah Junior College in 1966-67, and he identified himself as George L. Johnson. Okay, um, the picture of Cordy Johnson. Did I take the time to show that? Because I'm past that. I've got this in alphabetical order. Still. Yeah, Cordy Diedrich? Am I confused? Hey? No, I'm confused. Lola. Okay, there'll be a picture of Lola coming up. Sorry. Okay, the next person is James Henry Johnson. I have an enhancement to both his name and his exact birth and death dates. So here we are. 16 May 1864 through 3rd January 1949. He died single. Facts are revealed by the death certificate, which is transcribed here. You can see now Obadiah is being called Ob. He has a number of very various names he uses, and they're calling this a shepherd cemetery. And up there, the fact that it's typed, you can see it's James Henry Johnson. Okay, now the, this is the ancestor of the one that I was studying. Next is Joe Joseph. Joel. Middle name Anderson. Last name Johnson. Okay, he was the son of Obadiah Johnson and Nancy Shepard, and there's his full name, Joseph Joel Joe Anderson Johnson, and it, the facts are that in 1880 and 1900, he's living with his parents, 
and his death certificate reads Joe Anderson Johnson, but he's Joel in 1900 and 1880, and Joseph in the 1920 census. So, pick your choice. <laughs> um, his death record reveals the number of months, days, and years he's living, so his date of birth is January 8, 1874, although... Oh, that's, that's right. It was... I have to point this out. I forgot about this. Uh, Ed Johnson here. Sorry about the digression. But this Ed Johnson, the only record that exists of his birth or death anywhere is on this gravestone that I've been able to find, or it is incorrect. But I don't think so because I was able to examine... Uh, the one that was proposed as his, and that had a death year of uh, in the 40s, in 1946 with an almost identical birth date. And when I looked at the death certificate uh, related to the individual, he wasn't buried here, and he didn't seem to identify his parents as the ones I knew them to be, um, which I constantly confused and has now escaped me. But I've already mentioned, and anyway, I, <laughs> I've already mentioned it, so you rewind, but his the only death record is actually the record on his stone, <laughs> and I'm using that um, in this case, so good thing he put the whole, the whole birth, you know, no enhancement really, okay, so on this Mr. Joe Anderson Johnson, We've got Father Ob, Mother Nancy, and here's his death certificate, and they're saying he's being buried at the Shepherd Cemetery. Next individual is Alola Kendris Jones. Kendris. I have nothing really to add as far as enhancement to her dates. It's just her middle name and her maiden name. And the facts are revealed by her death certificate, which here daughter of C.N. Jones, and mother was Francis Bill Vaughn. Birth and death dates are identical to what's on the gravestone, and in this case they're calling it a shepherd cemetery. And this is the picture I was talking about. That um, the grandson of George Emmett Johnson has placed up on Ancestry. And don't worry about Wife of Seven, that's for another markation that I'm doing, but he says that it's Lola <coughs> holding her grandsons Don and Ronnie at 2601 Jackson Street in Paducah, Kentucky. Now, <coughs> if that is a portion of the what well, was Obadiah Johnson's farm, then I can yeah, then I can kind of get an idea of where he is and somehow try to translate into the quarter sections identified in the land grants. But without the assistance of the Bureau of Land Management. It's not much help, and the map that they provide is an 1890 map off of that land grant site. And uh, the location, actually, and I didn't do this, and I probably should. <laughs> this isn't even a complete map. The Obadiah Johnson land grant that was made in 1839 that was would have been given to a boy of seven years old, so I have my doubts, is here. And this is an old map, and, and Paducah basically is up here somewhere relative to this map. Kind of like where my Nicorette is. Okay, This is where Tom Shepard is. And he's, this, there's, there now isn't a place called Sharp. There's a Sharp Road. If you look at Google Maps, you can find a couple of roads that kind of do that, and a river that's much smaller than that big windy thing, and I kind of know where he is. There's a, uh, there's a school there, I think the Ridgeview School. He, he would have been somewhere in that area, if you want to look at Google Maps, to where he got his, his identify. Now, the problem is, is that the graveyard that I keep associating with land ownership here is about eight miles over here. <laughs> Off, off the map. Yeah, I don't have the whole map here. And this is this one I pasted and glued together from parts I got from that site. So I don't know if they're if they're actually off and where they place things. 
because they place Obadiah here all the way in the next county, which is Ballard County. And, and you know, although the age doesn't make any sense, and, I'm, and that's why I doubt that the record is for Obadiah, but everybody seems to be further east than I would expect them in general. Um, <clears throat> and I have to go by the way I can, the only way I could really identify is I have to look at that old map, then I have to say, okay, well, when I look at Google Maps, yeah, okay, there's a road there and there, and there's a lake there. It looks kind of like the lake on that map, okay. Yeah, he was probably around there. <laughs> That's the best I can do. Uh, they, they really don't interpret it to a modern day map or address, unfortunately. Okay, next is Nancy Ellen Shepard Johnson. I would add that enhancement. And <clears throat> she was born 30 June 1839, died 28 June 1921. And the facts are from the death certificate marriage record. So here is her death record. It incorrectly states her mother is Polly. Uh, the transcription incor incorrectly say, states it's Polly James. It's not, you can't see it. Uh, the camera isn't just doing that to you. You really can't tell what it says. It, I, you can kind of make out a Polly, and it, it could be a James mostly, but. It's mostly, you know, it's Jones actually, you know, but the way it's so smeared. Anyway, they're saying she's, you know, she's buried in the Shepherd Cemetery once again, and these are the birth and death dates they provide. Those are legible, but what isn't legible are the names of her parents and her birthplace. You can barely make out North Carolina. You can barely make out her father is Tom Shepherd. You can, you could kind of derive from the P O. And the somewhat of a MES that maybe this is a Pauly Jones, and so I had to get the better information from her, her sister, um, Rossi Pearl, we already looked at, of uh, who, who her parents were, because this was just not very well. Here is the record, marriage record between Obadiah Johnson and Nancy Ellen Shepard. And one prominent theme, of course, is almost gone and said so far in my presentation. Or no, I haven't is again, the relationships are proved by the fact that they're there in the graveyard itself. So, you know, here is a gravestone that says Obiah, but I know this to be Obadiah, and because that's because he's, he's buried here. Now, this Obiah, it is a very, very, very remote chance that Obadiah Johnson and Nancy Shepard had a child. No, actually there is no chance because the death record says um, he's buried at, do I have a death record? For, and, then, and this is Obadiah at the top, Shepherd's Graveyard. So he is buried there. Unless he's in one of the unmarked graves, I'll put it this way, unless Obadiah is in one of the unmarked graves and they had a son of which happened to be born and died between 1900 and 1910, and therefore I'd have no record of, and his name was Obiah. Um, there's no way this could be anybody else but Obadiah Johnson, who has gone by several names over his lifetime. Obadiah, Ob, O, Obadiah, Obadiah, Obadiah. That's who it is. The birth date is Actually, 1834, I'm going to do a presentation on Obadiah, and what I found and how I narrowed down who his parents were uh, after this, <laughs> which is also fairly complicated. I'm going to go through a set of records also. Um, but it's, it's fairly clear he kind of didn't know what year he was born in, but he had an idea. And so, or he upped his age by about five years when he first married Nancy Shepard in uh, 1860, 1861. I've, yeah, no, that's not, that's not the marriage record. Scrambling, it's all falling apart.
1861. Um, don't see why he would have a motive to up his age. I mean, he seemed to be, at 18, even at 1834, he was a 27-year-old man of sufficient age. Um, unless, okay, so here's his death, death record. Uh, death date, 1st January 1912, age of 82. That gives you an 1830. On census records, he shows up as October 1829. Most of them. In fact, here, here it is. It indicates as such. October or October 1830. And in the series of censuses that I look at, just to summarize what I did, is I looked at every Obadiah that has ever lived in this country that appeared in censuses between 18... Uh, 60 and 1870, no, 1850 and 1860, and I followed them to 1870 because I know that this Obadiah appears in an 1870 census in McCracken County, Kentucky, when he lives with Nancy Shepard. Um, and in that process, I was able to eliminate, uh, I, did, I, I searched using a variety of uh, spellings for Obadiah, and then I tried to follow those individuals wherever they were found. There were about 40 of them. Uh, uh, to see if they showed up in the next census. If not, I tried a name variation, or I looked for a son or a wife until I found them, and I was able to narrow the list down to seven, of which the only real believable set is an explanation that involves him going uh, from Monroe County, Tennessee, um, to through Ballard County. Kentucky, which is the next county over, and then showing up here. Now, I'm of a mind, no, not, Graves County's a different county, never mind. So anyway, and this one says he, he's buried at Shepherd's Graveyard. Arthur Johnson is sufficiently, you know, there's nothing really to add to this record, and so is Russell Lynn and William Roy, but I'll add that William, that I, based on the research that I've done and just the records I've compiled together, I know that this William Roy Johnson was the son of Joseph Joel and Fanny Lewis. James Lee Lofton married um, Roberta Wallace, who was the daughter of Thomas Jones Wallace. He's buried as Jones Wallace. So he's the daughter of Thomas Jones Wallace and Margaret Lavinia Shepherd. His exact dates, so the only things I would enhance, is 23. June 1866 through the 24th December 1947. Facts are, additional facts are revealed in his death certificate. They say they're burying, they're burying him in a shepherd's cemetery, and um, they're, they're, they're the exact dates. Roberta Lofton was born, <coughs> actually it's Roberta <coughs> Wallace Lofton. She's the daughter of Thomas Wallace and Lavinia Shepherd, Margaret Lavinia Shepherd. Thomas Jones Wallace and Lavinia Margaret <laughs> Shepherd. Oh, Alvina. <laughs> um, the, the facts for, for this is established in the death record, but. Her exact dates are 24 June 1867 through 30 September 1933. So I have a death certificate. And there is her parents. Father's name is now Jones Wallace with Lavinia Shepherd. And I'll pause here. A lot of these name switches that are taking place are because other, uh, I believe, because other uh, relatives, people would marry into the family and they'd have an identical name and they'd have a senior they'd be senior to the other person. So um, the more junior member of the family would start using their middle name at that point. And, if, and, if they, and I think, and my theory is, but I don't have anything to back this up, uh, is if they run out of a first and a second name, they just went by a nickname, <laughs> which they used a lot. Now in this case, she's being buried at a Wallace Cemetery. And hopefully I showed 
the birth and death dates for her for the exact dates that are more exact than the year it still helps if you get an exact month and day it still helps it helps differentiate between this Roberta, Wal Roberta Loft and some other Roberta Loft that may have died in Kentucky in the same year you know so the exact dates gonna differentiate just to know which one to pursue you know otherwise you can get stuck just on something simple like that um, this Ally McNeil, I was was you, you might think of um, the TV show, but um, this is actually the name of a man, and there was a story that was posted at Ancestry.com, the contents of which uh, every detail I've haven't found any contradictory evidence whatsoever, so I accept this for what it is. And also uh, supporting this is that at some points there's one or maybe two death certificates that actually call the graveyard a McNeil graveyard. These are the facts related to his birth and death. And I'll explain his relationship um, in the story that was provided by <coughs> at Ancestry.com by one of his relatives. He's now deceased, of course. So he was uh, Henry Bud Alley McNeil. Uh, born 29 March 1877, died 29 September 1948, and the story is as such. Um, so, in the early 80s, Doris Minton uh, researched the McNeil family and traced them back to her great 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 grandfather, who is Hector McNeil, 1785 through 1858. Using Ancestry.com, I have not only been able to verify her findings, but fill in a few additional names and dates as well. This is from original writings. Ali Henry Bud McNeil, son of William Henry and Roxanna McNeil, was born March 29, 1877, in McCracken County, Kentucky. He married Nola jo Josie Wallace in 1902, the daughter of Morris and Terry Ann White Wallace of Graves County, Kentucky. Nola Josie was born August 15, 1881. Bud Nola had 11 children. James Raymond, 1903. Violet, 1904. Morris, 1905, Ethel, 1906, Otho, 1908, Pauline, 1911, Lottie, 1912, Roscoe, Richard, 1913, Frank, 1915, and Geneva, 1917. Bunn owned a farm in McCracken County near Fremont, Kentucky. The old home place was located in what was now known as McNeil Road. Nola died at her home of pneumonia December 1, 1918. She was 37 years old. At a few years later, Bud married Molly Davis. It was a brief marriage. Bud left the farm and moved his family to Paducah in 1922. He worked for the city hauling gravel with the wagon team until he retired. He died at his home September 29, 1948. Bud Noller buried at Mount Pisgah Cemetery in Graves County, along with her three children, Lottie Frank and Roscoe Richard. Doris is also the source of several of the family photos of William H. McNeil, Roxanne McNeil, Sam McNeil, Nora Wallace, and for Terry Ann White was. As a, bound, as a young boy, I recall seeing many of these photos in her mother's home, Ethel. Okay. Just reinforcing records. Here's Morris Wallace and Terry Ann living together in 1900. Uh, this is their marriage record in Kentucky, Graves County. Here's a death record for Morris Nathaniel Wallace. Parents named as such. Okay, the next individual is a Randall E. Nichols, and he is definitely related to people that are probably now living. He is the son of the Nancy DeWeese. Or I don't know if I'm the son. He's related to the Nancy DeWeese that's married in the obituary for Mary Hopkins, if I got that right. And I don't want to run out of time, so. His exact dates as I have is May 1989 through 30th November 1961. Obviously, living individuals know who this person is and probably know the dates better than I do. So, what I got from the Social Security Death Index, reinforced by the Kentucky Birth Index, because that only has an R period E Nichols. Okay, Thelma Sanderson. Now, of all the Shepherd daughters, uh, the daughter that had married Mr. Sanderson, Elizabeth, is the only one who's uh, only has one descendant, as far as I know, that's buried at the cemetery. 
if she is buried at this cemetery, then it's in an unmarked grave, as is her, her husband. But I have eliminatory evidence that tells me that they're actually buried at Mount Kenton or other cemeteries. And so I don't have to, you know, so that the, at least those two people weren't buried here. If any of their descendants are buried here, then they're in mark, unmarked graves, but I don't know enough about their descendants to proceed. But she was born, she's actually the daughter, so she was born Thelma Anderson, and I can only enhance the date to say that her death date was 20 August 1910. The only proposed enhancement that I have, and this comes again from the Kentucky death records that are written by hand. There it is, and just, just to show you, here is Elizabeth Sanderson living with James B. This shows a relationship with the Shepherds, because Elizabeth Sanderson was born Elizabeth Shepherd. As shown. <laughs> She's not in 1850 and 1860 censuses here. And Elizabeth L. That are shown here. 1860 census. There is your Elizabeth right next to Jeroma, who is also Sarah Ann. Now they are living together, same birth years throughout. Laura Shepard simply is a sister who, as far as I know, never really married. She went by the name Mina also. So that I guess that I could add that enhancement. I don't have a death record for her. I know she died after the census taker left in 1870, but when that was, I don't know. She doesn't appear in the 1880 census, so it's probably between 1870 and 1880. The enhancement I have is 1850 to between uh, now that looks too, people are going to think she might have died on that day, but no, that's when the census taker took his records on, in 18, for the 1870 census, it was 26 July, 1873, 1880. Apparently she was single, I don't see any changes to her name, and again, she's in the census with Thomas Shepard and Mary Polly Jones, 1860, 1870. Sister Shepard, I have <coughs> identified as, within the context of who was the sister of Margaret Lavinia, it is possible that this Sister Shepherd, which is actually Mary L., if, if I'm right, I don't have proof here, I have circumstantial evidence that shows that I know where all the daughters were buried except for her, of Thomas Shepherd, Mary Polly Jones. She's the only one that's left. Now, I don't know if she was a nun or simply they just wanted to call her Sister Shepherd and ended at that. Um, there you are, and the dates I have for her is 1833 from the censuses and death between 1850 and 1860, and I didn't get so precise as to get the date that the census taker showed up in that part of um, McCracken County, Kentucky, but that's the enhancement I would have under pretty strong circumstantial evidence that, that you know, She's there. I'll, again, I don't have death certificate. The infant unknown, I don't have any information of, but hey, guess what? There's a little there's a little glass case there. Inside the glass case, there's information. And if it's illegible uh, from the plastic, I appeal uh, to whoever um, might be able to, to go to talk to an authority to ask them permission to get the information or if you are the authority to go ahead and open up the box and look at the record and find out who this actually was. And we don't know what the last name was, so I can't really ID that person. Saint, now the same pretty much goes with this unknown unknown, except that we do have one clue, and that that uh, this person was um, age nine year, four months, and three days and uh, was handled by maybe Mark's funeral home. I uh, don't know what year that would have been. If I had that, I might be able to identify who it was. This one, I don't see a marker with it. I can't do much, but I'm ready to say that this was one of these three here 
you know, two of which actually have information attached that somebody just has to bother to look. And certainly it's not the infant Johnson uh, that this uh, Josephine Lofton Harper would be. Uh, but I have found, and here is another one with the glass case. So this only one, if you don't find Josephine Lofton Harper in any of these glass cases, then that's her right there. Um, In fact, there's two of them without glass cases, so she's one of two. Here's her death certificate, and now they're saying they buried her in Harper Cemetery. But we've seen that before with other Harpers, and we will see that. And the same undertaker, which is Johnson Brothers, which is probably members of the Johnson family burying their own relatives. Here is Josephine Lofton. Here's her exact marriage date to eight to A.T. Harper, who I haven't identified further, and if he's buried there, then he's in one of the unmarked graves. This is Thomas Jones Wallace, the next person. And I have an enhancement of the name and birthdays. Here, is, here we go, Thomas Jones Wallace. He was husband to Margaret Lavinia Shepard, and he was born either November 1828 or 30, died in March 1917, and the facts are revealed from his, his uh, death certificate, but the censuses show that he was Thomas Joan Wallace, and the other death certificates I've gone over either calls him a Jones or a Thomas Wallace, but they're both married to the same woman. Um, here is Jones Wallace, and actually this is the name of his parents, Matt Wallace and Pasha Ann Pistol. Uh, this is his exact date. Now they're saying he's buried at the McNeil Cemetery. Same undertaker as Johnson Brothers. And again, it just says his age is 56 years, so we can't do much with it. We get more precision out of the censuses, which I use. And I've already gone over these records when they're living as neighbors in 1900. Um, here he is. In 1910, after Lavinia dies, uh, living with some of his children. Next is Lavinia Shepherd, Margaret Lavinia Shepherd Lost. Margaret Lavinia Shepherd Lost, uh, the only half I have is the Margaret. And she was the daughter of Thomas Shepard and Mary Polly Jones. And there's her marriage shown as an Alvina Shepard to Jones Wallace in, in, in McCracken County. And to show you that she was Margaret, she's in the 1840 and 1850 censuses. That's not going to show you, but the 1850 is going to show you right here a Margaret, which is better shown here. Now, she's got an M as a middle name there, and there's a Mary L, and at times I pondered whether Mary L was Mary, La Mary Lavinia. Um, she's two years older, though, and in subsequent censuses, that two years makes a difference because she because this Margaret is consistent. And also here she says she's born 1838 and in this 1850 census. This would be 1835. This would be 1837. So the the Mary in that case is closer. But her birth I'm going to look at this a little bit closer. It may end up being that this is actually Margaret Lavinia. Um, don't have subsequent censuses, except in the form of this 1900. She's living <coughs> with Mr. Wallace, ML, and it's got their 37. It may just be that this is not Margaret, but instead Mary. And that leaves unanswered what happened to Margaret. 
in that case, Margaret would be the sister shepherd. And I wonder if there's a little glass case next to Sister Shepherd that may shed some light on this, or the or the records that were uh, that are compiled at the Family History Library. Molly Wallace was um, the daughter of Thomas Jones Wallace and Margaret Lavinia Shepherd. Uh, exact birth date: 13 December 1867. Died 10 August 1934. Apparently, a single woman, reinforced by her death. Uh, certificate record and again saying that they're in Shepherd Cemetery Undertakers or Johnson Brothers the next one is Solomon C. Wallace and this is one exception to the rule that I said that everybody that's buried there is a descendant of Tom Shepherd or a, a spouse this was actually a brother of a spouse of a descendant of Tom Shepherd this is the brother of Thomas uh, Jones Wallace and his exact <coughs> dates was July 1835 through 16 September 1914, as best I can determine. <coughs> Here's his death certificate. Doesn't indicate the number of months or days he was living, only years. Um, we have a place of burial being the, now the McNeil uh, Cemetery. And don't see who the undertaker was, but I'm not going to dwell on that. Here he is, you know, the 1900 census listed as a brother of the head of the household. Right there. Doing that. So that's how I know he is the brother. Tommy Wallace is, there are two Tommy, there's a Tommy Wallace and there's a Tommy J. Wallace grave, there are two of them. One of them I judge to be the son of Thomas Jones Wallace, uh, and having a birth date of April 1876 from the 1900 census, and dying after 1910, where I can't find record of him anymore. And so, one of these two I can't connect to any family directly, but I bet you that he may be, one of these may be a grandson. Willie Wallace would be a child of Thomas Wallace, um, and he was born April 1879, died before 1910 when he disappears, or after 1910. He's in the 1900-1910 census. He had a wife named Willie, and I have not identified her yet. Okay, this is the, the film that I was talking about, the Family History Library. And so if you want to get the, her transcriptions, it will... I hope will enhance and fill in the gaps that I have in mine. Besides those little glass boxes, um, it's film number three two one three five eight. Just go down to the local family history center, pay them five bucks, order the film, and in about a week they'll call you. You can go down there and look at it on a microfilm machine, and you can save uh, JPEG copies of records onto disk if you bring a flash drive, or um, you can print out. It'll cost maybe 10 cents a page, what they have there. Okay, so now here's some other related censuses, but those weren't really important. I'm gonna, just going to reveal some eliminative pieces of information to individuals that are related to this family. So Elizabeth Shepard uh, ended up marrying uh, John Michael Dunaway, <coughs> and they ended up, none of them ended up being buried at the... Um, at the uh, at this cemetery, so these people would not occupy the the unmarked graves, and that includes John Mitchell Dunway, William H. Andrew Dunway. Although, yeah, I, you know, this is kind of unclear. It's it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have Johnson Brothers as undertakers. Uh, I don't know if it says family. Anne, maybe family annex for the Dunways, but you don't see a lot of Dunways there, but they could be unmarked. Here is Eva Doom, who had married John Daniel Johnson, who is the son of Joel, Joe, Joseph Anderson Johnson, and she's buried in the Doom Chapel, so she would not be buried there. This is a different yard. John Daniel Johnson is the son of Obadiah and Nancy Ellen. He's not buried there, though. He is buried at Mount Pleasant in Graves County. 
than uh, Willie Lovelace, who is uh, the son of the first husband of Elizabeth Shepherd, who also descendants don't appear in, in this cemetery, is uh, is buried at Owens Cemetery. It looks like. And Elizabeth Sanderson, who is the mother of the uh, the the child that was buried there, she is the daughter of Oak Johnson, Nancy Shepard, and she's buried at Maple Lawn, and so is her husband, James Buford Sanderson. Hopefully, I caught these. I'm just going to get them on camera again because I'm just flying through these, hoping I'm not going to run out of disk space and do this all over again. So I'm not going to be in the mood to do so. These are all eliminated death records. These people would not occupy the unmarked graves at that cemetery. <coughs> and since this works for L.E. Dunway and Lisa Dunway. Okay, so I'm done. I'm going to stop. I don't want to lose this. So I'm going to load this up. And I hope uh, my presentations enhance the records and is informative and helpful to the people.